Hi, boys. Welcome to Daddy Cast. Exploring Insects, Week 10. Metal Plating. In the morning, some wandering coppersmiths were passing Mother Amber. Let's see. In the morning, some wandering coppersmiths were passing. Mother Ambrosine had sold them the old kettle. Besides the sale, they were to make over the lamp whose foot had melted on the stove and replate two saucepans. So the smiths lighted a fire in the open air, set up their bellows on the ground, and in a large round iron spoon melted the old lamp, adding a little tin to replace what had been lost. The melted metal was run into a mold from which it came out in the shape of a lamp. This lamp, still pretty large, was fixed on a lathe which was which a little boy set in motion, and while it turned, the master touched it with the edge of a steel tool. The tin, thus planed off, fell in thin shavings, rolled up like curl papers. The lamp was visibly becoming perfect. It took the proper polish and shape. Afterward, they busied themselves plating the copper saucepans. They cleaned them thoroughly inside with sand, put them on the fire, and, when they were very hot, went over the whole of their surface with a tow pad and a little melted tin. Wherever the pad rubbed, the tin stuck to the copper. In a few moments, the inside of the saucepan, red before, was now shiny white. Emile and Jules, while eating their lunch of apples and bread, looked on at this curious work without saying a word. They promised themselves to ask their uncle the reason for whitening the inside of the copper saucepans with tin. In the, in the evening, accordingly, they spoke of tinning and plating. Highly cleaned and polished iron is very brilliant, explained their uncle. The blade of a new knife, Claire's scissors, carefully kept in their case, are examples. But if exposed to damp air, iron tarnishes quickly and covers itself with an earthy red crust called rust, interposed Claire. Yes, it is called rust. The big nail, the big nails that hold the iron wires where the bell flowers climb up the garden wall are covered with that red crust, remarked Jules, and Emile added, the old knife I found in the ground is covered with it too. Those large nails and the old knife are encrusted with rust because they have remained for a long time exposed to the air and dampness. Damp air cor corrodes iron. It becomes incorporated with the metal and makes it unrecognizable. When rusty, iron no longer has the properties that make it so useful to us. It is a kind of red or yellow earth, in which, without looking attentively, it would be impossible to suspect a metal. I can well believe it, said Jules. For my part, I should never have taken rust for iron, with which air and moisture had become incorporated. Many other metals rust like iron. That is to say, they are converted into earthy matter by contact with damp air. The color of rust varies according to the metal. Iron rust is yellow or red. That of copper is green. Lead and zinc, white. Then the green rust of old pennies is copper rust, said Jules. The white matter that covers the nozzle of the pump must be lead rust, queried Claire. Exactly. The prime difficulty with rust is that it makes metals ugly. They lose their brilliance and polish, but it works still greater injury. There are harmless rusts which might get mixed with our food without danger, such as iron rust. On the contrary, copper and lead rusts are deadly poisons. If by mischance these rusts should get into our food, we might die, or at least we should experience cruel suffering. We will speak only of copper, for lead, on account of its quick melting, cannot go on the fire, and is not used for kitchen utensils. Copper rust, I say, is a mortal poison, and yet they prepare food in copper vessels, asked Mother Ambroisine. Very true, said she, but I always have my eye on my saucepans. I keep them very clean, and from time to time have them replated. I don't understand, put in Jules, how the work that the tinsmith did this morning would prevent copper rust being a poison. The smith's work will not make copper rust cease to be a poison, replied Uncle Paul, but it will prevent the rust's forming. Of the common metals, tin rusts the least. Exposed to the air a long time, it scarcely tarnishes, and then the rust, which forms in small quantities, is innocuous, like iron rust. To prevent copper from covering itself with poisonous green spots, to preserve it from rust, it must be kept from contact with damp air, and also with certain alimentary substances, 
that means food substances, such as vinegar, oil, grease, substances that provoke the rapid formation of rust. For this reason, the copper saucepan uh, is coated over with tin inside. Under the thin bed of tin which covers it, the copper cannot rust because it is no longer in contact with the air. The tin remains, but this metal changes with difficulty, and besides, its rust, if it forms any, is harmless. So they plate copper, that is to say, they cover it with a thin bed of tin to prevent its rusting, and thus to prevent the formation of the dangerous poison that might someday or other be mixed with our food. They also tin iron, not to prevent the formation of poison, for the rust of this metal is harmless, but simply to preserve it from changing and covering itself with ugly red spots. This tinned iron is called tin plate. Lids, coffee pots, dripping pans, graters, lanterns, and innumerable other things are of tin plate, that is to say, thin sheets of iron covered on both sides with a coating of tin. Next chapter, gold and iron. Some metals never rust. Such a one is gold. Ancient gold pieces found in the earth after centuries are as bright as the day they were coined. No dross, no rust covers their effigy and inscription. Time, fire, humidity, air cannot harm this admirable metal. Therefore, gold, on account of its unchangeable luster and its rarity, is preeminently the material for ornaments and coins. Furthermore, Gold is the first metal that man became acquainted with long before iron, lead, tin, and the others. The reason why man's attention was called to gold long centuries before iron is not hard to understand. Gold never rusts. Iron rusts with such grievous facility that in a short time, if we are not careful, it is converted into a red earth. I have just told you that gold objects, however old they may be, have come to us intact even after having been in the dampest ground. As for objects of iron, not one has reached us that was not in an unrecognizable state. Corroded with rust, they have become a shapeless, earthy crust. Now, I will ask Jules if the iron ore that is extracted from the bowels of the earth can be real, pure iron, such as we use. It seems to me not, Uncle, for if iron at any given moment is pure, it must rust with time and change to earthy matter, as does the blade of a knife buried in the ground. My brother seems to reason correctly. I agree with him, said Claire. And gold, Uncle Paul asked her. It is different with gold, she replied, as that metal never rusts. It is not changed by time, air, and dampness. It must be pure. Exactly so. In the rocks, where it is disseminated in small scales, Gold is as brilliant as in jewelers' boxes. Claire's earrings have not more luster than the particles set by nature in the rock. On the contrary, what a pitiful appearance iron makes when it is found. It is an earthy crust, a reddish stone, in which only after long research can one suspect the presence of a metal. It is, in fact, rust mixed more or less with other substances, and then it is not enough to perceive that this rusty stone contains a metal. A way must be found to decompose the ore and bring the iron back to its metallic state. How many efforts were necessary to attain this result? One of the most difficult to achieve. How many fruitless attempts, how many painful trials. Iron, then, was the last to become of use to us long after gold and other metals like copper and silver, which are sometimes, but not always, found pure. That most useful of metals was the last, but with it an immense advance was made in human industry. From the moment man was in possession of iron, he found himself master of the earth. Now let's take a look at the picture and the caption of the picture. It's a miner with his gold mining pan. They take gravel and dirt to the sides of the streams and roll it about in wooden bowls. After a while, there is nothing but the gold and the gravel. The miners throw the gravel away by a handful. Illustration by unknown artist in Carpenter's Geographical Reader. Now let's go back to this picture also. 
It says a wagon comprised to carry the essential, essential equipment for blacksmiths and artisans to perform their work. So they would put the coal in here. Here's this thing that made, it's a blower to heat the coals when they're on fire, and then they can use it to heat the metal that they're working on. <clears throat> At the head of substances that resist shock, iron must be placed, and it is precisely its enormous resistance to rupture that makes this metal so precious to us. Never would a gold, copper, marble, or stone anvil resist the blows of the smith's hammer as an iron one does. The hammer itself, of what substance other than iron could it be made? If of copper, silver, or gold, it would flatten, crush, and become useless in a short time, for these metals lack hardness. If of stone, it would break at the first rather hard blow. For these implements, nothing can take the place of iron, nor can it for axes, saws, knives, the mason's chisel, the quarryman's pick, the plowshare, and a number of other implements which cut, hew, pierce, plane, file, give or receive violent blows. Iron alone has the hardness that can cut most other substances, and the resistance that sets blows at defiance. In this respect, iron is, of all mineral substances, the handsomest present that providence has given to man. It is preeminently the material for tools, indispensable in every art and industry. <clears throat> Claire and I read one day, said Jules, that when the Spaniards discovered America, the men of that new country had gold axes, which they very willingly exchanged for iron ones. I laughed at their innocence, which made them give such a costly price for a piece of very common metal. I think I now see that the exchange was to their advantage. Yes, decidedly to their advantage, for with an iron axe they could fell trees to make their dugout canoes and their huts. They could better defend themselves against wild animals and attack the game in their hunts. This piece of iron gave them an assurance of food, a substantial boat, a warm dwelling, a redoubtable weapon. In comparison, a gold axe was only a useless plaything. If iron came last, what did men do before they knew of it? They made their weapons and tools of copper, for like gold, this metal is sometimes in a pure state so that it can be utilized just as nature gives it to us. But a copper implement, having little hardness, is of much less value than an iron one. Thus, in those far-off days of copper axes, man was indeed a wretched creature. He was still more so before knowing copper. He cut a flint into a point, or split it, and fastened it to the end of a stick, and that was his only weapon. With this stone, he had to procure food, clothing, a hut, and to defend himself from wild beasts. His clothing was a skin thrown over his back, his dwelling, a hut made of twisted branches and mud. His food, a piece of flesh, produce of the chase, domestic animals were unknown, the earth uncultivated, all industry lacking. On this page, we have a picture that says an iron mine. Illustration by unknown artist. All right, talking about the man with the flint and the stick. And where was that? asked Claire. Everywhere, my dear child. Here, even in places where today are our most flourishing towns. Oh, how forlorn man was before attaining, by the help of iron, the well-being that we enjoy today. How forlorn was man, and what a great president Providence made him by giving him this medal. Just as Uncle Paul finished, Jacques knocked discreetly at the door. Jules ran to open it. They whispered a few words to each other. It was, an about, it was about an important affair for the next day. All right. I guess the picture on this page is really for the next chapter, the fleece. All right. Talk to you guys later. <clears throat>